Uh, well, hello everyone. I'm Heidi Austin. I'm the district vet based with Northwest Local Land Services here in Tamworth. And today I'm going to run through uh, just a bit of a presentation update on what's happening with foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Uh, and then I thought I'd just launch into some of the stuff I'm seeing locally after that. And I'll throw it out to you guys. You can ask questions and, you know, we can we can discuss it um, in more depth and, and things like that. So first things first, who in the room, I suppose, do you all have livestock on your properties? We got a show of hands for cows, lots. What about a show of hands for sheep? Less of you. Uh, anyone with pigs? Pardon? <laughs> Feral ones. What about anyone with camels? Elephants? No? Pardon? Giraffes? Okay. No, that's fine. Goats? Anyone farm goats? No? No goat people. Okay, that's good. You'll all be um, probably very, very, well, actually. So who's very worried about foot and mouth disease? Can we have a show of hands? Who's moderately worried? Who's not at all worried? Some people, okay. I just thought I'd throw it out there and, and tell you all about some of the signs that you'll see in your livestock if you, if you are unfortunate enough to you know, ever see a case of foot and mouth disease. And foot and mouth disease is a virus that affects multiple species. And the species that are affected are our ungulates, so they're, you know, got a cloven hoof. And so, as we can see, cattle, buffalo, sheep, goats, pigs, camelids and deer. I didn't mention the buffalo and the deer, did I? But does anyone have any of those? Not the oxy, look the oxy I know, they are. These, I've seen these guys when I've been up walking. So, foot and mouth disease is a vesicular disease, which means that it causes vesicles or erosions in the mouth predominantly in the mouth and on the feet. So who's ever been walking in bad boots and got a blister on their heel? I have, right? So if you end up with those blisters from your heel, like all through your mouth and on your feet, all over your, like your coronary bands and in the interdigital space, how are you going to feel? Not shitty. shitty. Yeah, you're going to feel shitty. So... The first thing that these animals do is they spike a fever, so they go off their food. They feel really sick. If they're a dairy cow, they'll drop their milk. There'll be no, like overnight, bang. The next thing is they start to drool because they're developing these lesions in their mouth and their mouth gets really sore and that then also prevents them from eating. They're also developing lesions on their feet and this is particularly in cattle. They get really sore and they start having a shifting lameness thing happening like this because they sort of don't know where to put their weight. And when they're really bad, what they're doing is they're, they're slobbering, their mouth is really, really sore, and they've got this shifting lameness thing happening. And so I do do a reasonable rendition of a foot and mouth cow. And my children would uh, tell you that I can be a cow on any particular <laughs> moment in any particular day. So. Your foot and mouth disease cow will drool, so she's slobbering, and her mouth is so sore that she starts chomping her jaws and grinding her teeth, and she's got a shifting lameness. So if you can all hear this, it's like... <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not nice, but it's also fairly easy to spot in a cow because the lesions are all so overt and particularly in, a, in an intensively managed dairy system, right? Sheep, unlike your cattle, the signs aren't necessarily as um, obvious. And so with your sheep, you might just get a few lesions around their coronary bands on their feet. And so they might be lame. You might have a number of them feeling a bit crook. Maybe they're under the tree when they should be out grazing or whatever. So in a pastoral situation, it's going to be harder to spot in your sheep maybe than, than your cattle. So that's, that's a bit of a, a message. The pigs, here we have a little snout, they get these lesions on their snouts and, and as those blisters 
rupture and the top comes off them, they're full of fluid and that full, fluid's full of virus. But underneath that you end up with this um, sort of granulating lesion that's red and, and sore. And those, um, those blisters kind of progress and finally will, will heal up. And pigs get really high fevers. They feel really dreadful. They lie down and they're really hard to get them to get on their feet because they're, they're really lame and their mouths are sore. So it's, it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty nasty disease. It has high morbidity and low mortality. So what that means is that lots of animals get sick but not many die. So, you know, if you're watching, your, looking at your animals and you're worried that you, you might see something unusual and there's one of them and there's no more, well, it's probably unlikely to be foot and mouth disease, but you still should check it, get it checked out by a vet. But if you've got lots of animals that are, that are crook and you, you're really worried, then that's, that's your, um, one of your big signs that you need to have them checked. The other disease that we're all jumping up and down about a bit at the moment is lumpy skin disease and it affects cattle and buffalo. So those other species, sheep, whatnot, don't get affected by this. It's also a virus and it gives these skin lesions or lumps and they, they kind of fester and they cavitate and you get uh, like a, I suppose, a, a mucky, pussy centre in it that then drops out. And they end up looking like these sort of these mini volcanoes here. Uh, and this is your end stage where they're starting to scar down. Um, lumpy skin disease, it can affect a cow like this where it's just all over the hide and all over the body. Or you can get a percentage of animals that might only have a few little lesions on them that could easily look like something else. So cattle get lumps for plenty of reasons. Does anyone want to throw out, does anyone know another disease that might look like this in cattle, that young cattle get all the time? Pesty. Pesty virus. That is a really good differential for foot and mouth disease because um, pesty virus gives lesions in the mouth and on the feet and they get a fever and they also get some diarrhoea, but they don't so much get get the lumps. Anyone seen young cattle with warts? Yeah, and they kind of come up and, and go away. They can get all sorts of viruses, all sorts of lumps for other reasons. And, uh, and so in the past, we might all have thought, oh, our cows have just got a few lumps, but now it's really important to get those animals checked out when they've got lumps, just to make sure that we're not dealing with a mild case of lumpy skin disease. <coughs> So we all know the consequences of an outbreak of one of these diseases. We export about, you know, over 70% of our product. And with, an, with a disease incursion of these types, we lose our exports and markets crash and it's not very good for anybody. Where is it? So here's foot and mouth disease through Indonesia. And... I think that's barley there, is it? Or is that one? That's Denpasar. So there should be a, a dot on there. Now this is lumpy skin disease where we've found it in Indonesia. So if I go back to this slide there, lumpy skin disease is sort of through here as well. Now what we're really worried about, see here we've got Timor, and here we have Papua New Guinea. And they're very close to here, aren't they? So just keep that in mind when we get on to how these things spread and how they transfer and how they're likely to come in to Australia. And I can backtrack a bit. So foot and mouth disease is likely to be carried in by a human that is importing a product that has it in it. So the virus is very stable and can remain viable in processed meat, bacon, pigs, trotters, that sort of thing. And so what we think is that someone will bring in a product that's infected with foot and mouth disease virus and they won't consume it all and they will feed it to a backyard pig. Now the pig is an amplifier of the virus, so the pig eats the virus 
and amplifies it into their respiratory tract and then cough and breathe it out in a plume. So the pig will breathe out a viral plume that can go up and then that pig is likely to live next door or with, quite happily, a sheep or a goat or a, num or a small flock of sheep or a few numbers of goats that, that are being transported around a lot. And so it can go pig to sheep and that sheep then just has to go to another sheep and go through a sale yard and we all know how livestock move around Australia uh, and then it's, it's off out there. So we're most worried about peri-urban areas of our big cities for incursions of foot and mouth disease. Basically, lumpy skin disease can be spread by a mozzie and biting insects and that then harks back to if we end up with lumpy skin disease in Timor or Papua New Guinea, storm events and trade winds and things like that can, mozzies go up, float along in the wind and come down into northern Australia. So our incursions for lumpy skin disease that we're really worried about are going to be from spread of insects this way. So that's just, you know, giving you a bit of an overview there. We got any questions on that? No? Okay. I popped this map up just simply to trigger me to have a bit of a chat about vaccines. <coughs> Are there any questions about the use of vaccine and how the vaccine... So I haven't gone in great detail into how a response would be undertaken. I didn't know whether this was the right spot to do that, but I, I can talk about that if people want me to. Uh, but often I find... Okay, all right, let me go back. Who uses seven in one or five in one or something like that on their animals or six in one for their sheep? Yeah, right. So I, I often get asked, why don't we just start vaccinating for foot and mouth disease in Australia right now? Has anyone thought that? Or is everyone across that? Got one at the back. Maybe no one's um, happy to say. Right, do you want me to go through that or not? Can I, I'll just give you a bit of a rundown. So there's disease freedom and then there's disease freedom and there's different levels of it. So our top standard of disease freedom from these diseases we have, and that's called, we recognised as free from foot and mouth disease without vaccination. So that gives us top tier trading ability with the rest of the world. Second level, disease freedom, free from foot and mouth disease with vaccination. So who have we here? Brazil. And, and, and um, bits of South America. You know, so we have a, the, the a delegate plays out in the, the room. <laughs> from Col Colombia? Or is that Colombia? Then they become stranded. <coughs> Venezuela. And then Columbia. we have to find somewhere to so put Col them. Sorry, we have a Colombian in the room. And her vaccination status is free from FMD with vaccination. So this means that there's no clinical cases of FMD, but they're vaccinating. And that is a lower tier of freedom. So if Australia is to preemptively vaccinate to stop foot and mouth disease coming in or stop our animals getting it, then we lose that high level tier. So it will never be used as, well, at this point in time, I can't say never, gets me into trouble, but it won't be used as a preventative. It's used in the strategy to control the disease. So if we get a disease outbreak, what will happen is there'll be infected premises and zones put around them and animals, um, it's terrible to say, but they'll get slaughtered in, in rings and then there'll be vaccine rings put around um, your zones to help control it. And that's how vaccination will be used to, to limit the spread outwards from a focus of infection in the country rather than as a preventative. So have I still got everyone or have I lost you? If I say nothing, will someone else say something? <laughs> okay, so the key, the key that we can do to limit if we, if we have an incursion of foot and mouth disease here in Australia, the key thing that we can do is shut it down as quickly as possible. It's the difference between a huge economic 
loss and, and devastation to communities and people's welfare and being in mental health and their livestock and the whole thing is just getting on top of it as quickly as we can. Now, we can't do that unless we have all our NLIS stuff up to date and fully done because traceability is the key. So if, um, if we get a disease incursion, then my counterparts get on the computer straight away and start tracing. And dependent on the lesions in the mouth, we'll age them. So it's something I didn't talk about. So we, we can tell if they're fresh lesions. So if that animal contracted that disease four days ago, a week ago or whatever. So we'll set up a window of traceability and we'll trace ons and offs at property with those, um, with those animals. And that will be the key to finding where it's gone and where it's come from. And that, so that is key to shutting it down. And then we'll, you know, put, um, make, put the zones in place and things to just contain it and get rid of it and hopefully limit the spread within Australia. So diagnostically, I suppose you're possibly thinking this, maybe you're not, but... I go and look at your animal and I think it might have foot and mouth disease. I take the samples from it that are required. They then go down to our animal health laboratory at Geelong or Arl, and within about 24 hours, we'll have a yes or a no for that. If, if that's a yes, or also if I'm worried enough at the time, I can presumptively call it and we will then enter into a three-day national livestock standstill, which means that no animals, no un ungulates within Australia can move for three days. So if you're on your farm with your cows in the paddock, that's not such a bad thing. But if you're a backgrounding operation or you're a feedlot or you're a sale yard, then that can pose huge um, implications on you on your operation and, and how you're going to manage that going forwards. And so that will be a minimum of 72 hours and it may go out to, to three weeks. So this ties back into traceability and NLIS. So to limit spread of disease, we stop all animals moving, like bang, no more, no one going anywhere. And then we all start tracing madly to work out where the disease might have come from and spread to. And so until we have a very good handle on where it's gone, where it's come from. All your animals d can't move. If you've got them on another farm on adjustment, you can't walk them down the road and bring them home. You can't put them on a truck and take them somewhere. They just have to stay where they were at the time of the standstill. If they're on a truck going somewhere else, <coughs> excuse me, they have four hours to either get to where they're going or get home again. So you've got that four hour window to get, to get them back. So we're all doing a lot of work within communities on where they can go, say to the, the, um, the livestock exchange or whether the sale yards can have them or where we can actually put stranded animals and it might be say with pigs like they can't be stranded on a truck in summer particularly for any length of time it might be about making permits to get them to an abattoir where they need to go you know so five minutes there you go George was wondering if I could fill the time well <coughs> now I've got two sisters who are teachers and they hate people having their mobile phones out when they're talking to them. But what I'm going to ask you now to do is everyone take out their mobile phone and put in this number, please. Anyone with livestock. So it's the Emergency Animal Disease Watch hotline. You can call it in your phone. You can put the contact as the EAD watch hotline. And this is where I'll do an interpretive dance. And the number is... 1-800-675-888. It's getting recorded and this is going to be really embarrassing. Okay. 1-800-675-888. So if that hasn't made you stick it in your phones. 
nothing will. See, I believe in this cause so strongly that I'm happy to act like an idiot in front of a room of farmers for the cause. And a journalist. And a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, five minutes. What can you guys do? Do your farm by security planning? Pardon? You missed the number. Help the rest of them. 1 800 675 888. Pestivirus, yes. Yeah. Um, pestivirus is. Where do I start? A viral disease. Symptoms first. Okay, so. It affects cattle in a number of ways. If, if cattle are first exposed to pestivirus when they are not pregnant, then they'll get a mild respiratory type syndrome and that's all you'll see. If they are naive, so they've never met it before, and they get it when they're pregnant, it depends on the stage of pregnancy as to what will happen and it will affect the fetus. Now, I'll probably get quoted on this and I hate getting quoted on numbers, but rubbery figures here, first trimester of pregnancy, they'll lose that embryo and they can return to service. Second trimester, up to about five months, maybe the brain's trust will tell me that. The fetus doesn't have a competent immune system and so the virus incorporates with the fetus and it doesn't know to fight the virus. It doesn't know the virus is not self. And so then you'll get what we call a persistently infected pestivirus calf born. So it's gone across the placenta into the calf in that sort of mid trimester. End stage, you can either probably get normal calves or stillbirths or calves with, with other problems born. But your main issue is that persistently infected pestivirus calf. They, they're born and they can live out a reasonably normal life. So they can end up at the Royal Show as a stud animal, beautiful and big and fat and healthy and amazing, uh, and still be carrying pestivirus persistently within their body. But usually what we see is those woody little animals that don't grow, they're your persistently infected pestivirus calves. So if you're thinking if you're trading cattle and you're buying light stock to put weight on, and you buy a heap of light stock and one of them just isn't keeping up with everybody, that may well have pestivirus. And sometimes within that animal, that virus can mutate and then you end up with mucosal disease, which is where they scour and they get, they can get ulcerative lesions in their mouths and they can get lesions on their feet as well. And I've seen them with interdigital dermatitis and, and also with sort of cracking and things on the bulbs of their heel where it's almost peeling away like onion rings. So it's, it's not very nice. And those animals usually go on to die reasonably quickly from getting mucosal, from the time it changes and gets mucosal disease. What do you do? Shoot and burn? Yep. Yep. So they, they, won't, they won't live. And often the persistently infected animals, because it's playing havoc with their immune systems, they then will, will go on to die anyway and they won't they're not viable is that so you can you can vaccinate them with a program or if they're exposed before they're pregnant to a persistently infected animal they can get natural immunity very random depends on how gregarious the calf is and how they'll get around with everyone and touch noses and do that right oh george has wound me up everyone Yep, yep, and it's, it, you can test it really easily with a bit of tail hair. What's the prevalence in this area? Oh, I think they say, what is it, something like 98% of beef cattle farms have it, so I see it commonly, like really commonly. Yeah. Oh, are you going to be here during lunch? Yes. Yeah, so if we've got any yeah, individual questions, phone by tonight. All right, I'm sorry I've gone over time, yeah, everyone. No, Oh, well, I just had a picture of a sheep with Barb's pole worm. Does anyone want to see that? Yep, yep. Come on. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
See, this is what vets love. They just love this gross, wormy stuff. These are all, so that's a sheep with a bottle jaw, as you, um, and this is gonna be a major issue this summer. Lots of ways of managing it. I don't know that any of them are particularly, going to be particularly effective or particularly good. So that's a whole nother conversation, but just wanted to put that on sheep producers' radars. We have been through a dreadful winter with black scour worm. Some of you may or may not have had issues with that. So summer's going to be this dude, which is not nice. And then I know you're all here for a pasture thing, so I throw in the bloated bull. And this is not really what you want to see in the morning, is it? But he was grazing irrigated ryegrass, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a legume. Uh, and I did have a photo of a cow that died like with a nose down like this on, on arrow leaf clover, which I was told by the man that grew it was less bloaty than other clovers, but it still did the job on her. So I think um, be, um, be aware and I don't know, this is meant to have sound with it. So this is the ingester in this bull. And can you see how it's kind of like, um, this, is a, this is a frothy bloat with a heap of gas bubbles in it. And when I was um, squeezing it in my fingers, it kind of was crackling like bubble wrap almost, like the air bubbles were um, bursting under my fingers. And, uh, and Interestingly, when I opened this animal up, it had a bloat line in its esophagus. And there's certain things that I find on autopsy, and there's a really big word that I use, pathognomic, which means that that is diagnostic on autopsy of that condition. So a bloat line in the esophagus means that this died of bloat. There's nothing else that'll get a bloat line. So while it was eating um, ryegrass and the farmer was going, oh, that can't be bloat, it actually was. And this bull, he was naughty and he didn't have his hay for dinner missed his hay for the day. Yeah, so anyway. Uh, George, any questions or I wind no, it up now? Yeah, just did I fill your time, yeah. George? I did. Yeah. Was that because it wasn't given to him? Or was no, he just, he chose not to. Maybe, yeah. So he just didn't, he didn't eat his roughage. It was in feeders, at, like for ad lib access. So that, that was just, um, he was the only one on that farm and that was probably just bad luck. And often, I don't want anyone to beat themselves up about bloated animals because often I do see them grazing where everything is being done properly and it seems to not be that easy to prevent. So, But anyway, happy to talk about it at more length later. <laughs>